Ladies, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke and learn me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. You should find rest for your soul. Which is a remarkable thing for a man to say. Nobody else said it. Now that passage right there in Romans chapter 8, 28 says something you can't find in any religious literature of the world. I think Romans chapter 8, verse 28 there says that God has a promise for you and makes you a promise and commits himself to a proposition that is absolutely impossible. It says, for we know, we don't guess, we know. We know all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, if you ever stop thinking about what a monstrous statement that is, that statement says God can fix things out so everything that happens to you works for your good. Next time you talk to the black Muslim, ask him what Muhammad gave you like that. Folks said the religion all the same. You got your mind. You got your mind. Just nutty as a fruit. There isn't any religion in the world that gives you a promise like what, what you just read. Find it. Find it. You can't find it. The Lord says, all things work together for good to them that love God. Now, that's a great promise. Matter of fact, that's the greatest promise in the Bible. But it's unconditional. Now, there's one promise that is better than that, but it's conditional. So some of you folks couldn't claim it. There's a passage over in 2 Corinthians that says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, so that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound every good work. I just said a mouthful. There's nothing in school you can get like that. There isn't any promise of a politician. You don't know anybody in the world that can make you a promise like that. Nobody. God is able to make all grace abound toward you. So always, having all sufficiency, may abound every good work. Nothing says, that thing says no matter what you go through, God's able to give you all the grace you need to get through it all the time to do anything you ought to do. Amen. But that's got a catch to it. You might have known that. That's, cat, that's dependent upon giving. If you're tight, you can't claim that one. That's a little giving. Now this one here is unconditional. Well, you say, Brother Ruffin, it says to them that love God. What if I don't love God? Do I still get the conditions? Yes. You say, well, how come? Is there a condition upon loving God? Yeah, but you look at that greater context there. Look at the next verse. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate. That's every Christian. Whom he predestinated, he called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. See that thing? That's not talking about a practical day-by-day -day thing, loving God, like, like the Lord has given the crown of life to them that love it, saying that endure temptation. That's not talking about that. That's a theological type of thing. That's, just, that's saying that the people who trusted Jesus Christ are the ones who love God. You say, why? Because they've been called, they've been justified, they've been glorified. That's every Christian. Now, the RSV, you might know it, box it up. And folks say, well, bubble up my foot aside. Well, they shut your mouth for a while and think. I'm not getting sick of fire these people saying, every time you try to tell them, you're all right. Some of you folks are thin skin, you can blow smoke for you. <laughs> How did you get upset with me and don't get upset with somebody messing with you about it? Yeah. Yeah. Problem there, don't you? Amen, the RSV the says we know that in everything God works together for good. That ain't no promise. Right, you call it a promise? <laughs> what fool has to be told that God does right? Yeah. Well, we know sure God works, uh, you know, God works together for good. I mean, we know everything that God, God does is right. What you are, you're not worried about God doing right. You you worried about, you worried about, you worried about what you worried about. You worry about the stuff you're going through. Yeah, that's right. That's what you're worried about. That's right. You know what you're worried about? You're worried about all things working together for good. And that's what the text says. Amen. If you have a King James Bible. Amen. Now, if you've got something else, you're not going to have anything but the wizard of the cock. I don't know. <laughs> but he says, uh, he says, we know that all things work together for good to them and love God with a call according to his purpose. Now, that thing that means what it says, or it doesn't. And I'm a literalist, you know. I think my Bible is more than a conqueror for the middle of this. I read my Bible, this present light affliction for his blood of holy, working before. I know that stuff and I can quote back and words. But sometimes you wonder, you know. I mean, have you ever had to live off that verse for a while? Well, this is the Greek says, I feel the Greek you wouldn't have it anyway. I mean, Amen. there's some promise in that book, the Greek doesn't put any light on at all. Amen. I'll give you one. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Right. You believe that? How many believe that? Let's see your hands. Okay, I wasn't told the truth. <laughs> you say, well, I did. Well, I'm, I'm sincere, too. I think I'm telling the truth when I say I believe it, but, but I don't know. <laughs> Look at here. 
I can do anything I ought to do through Christ. That's what the verse says. I can do all things through Christ. You can. You believe that you? Maybe you tithe. <laughs> Maybe give a bow a tithe. Maybe you can witness. Maybe you can pass, you can pass out tracts and preach on the street. Amen, Maybe brother. Maybe you can control your temper. Maybe you can shut your big mouth when you want to control your big mouth. Uh, uh, so we say we believe. Now let me ask you: If you got the Greek original on that, what would you know you don't know right now, yeah. brethren? There's some things in that Bible you have to learn by going through them. You can't run them by just reading off, you know, words. <laughs> I said to myself one day: Do all things really work together for good? And I know some things. You know what I'm going to do tonight? I'm going to turn the seven devils loose on the Christian, try to get home to glory, and see what they, what kind of damage they do. I'm going to pick the seven worst devils I can think of. I mean, the text says we know uh, the Christian, the Christian is a, it will never be in, in good with the world. But the only kind of Christian good with the world are the Christians that are waver back and forth and act like they don't know anything. Yeah. Now, we know. Look at here. We know we passed the death of life for the love of brethren. Yeah. We know he abides on us by his spirit to give us. We know when he shall appear, we should be like him. We know we passed up the life because we love the brethren. I know who my have all that stuff. We know plenty. Amen. Some folks think it's proud to be agnostic. Well, maybe it's honest. <laughs> but you don't have to be proud of being, about being a dumbbell. There's something you can know. That's right. And Come you on. can know that all things work together for good of them that love God and the call according to his purpose. So we'll take a fellow here and we'll bring him in and we'll get him started up toward glory and then we'll see what happens to him on the way. And Turn the devil loose on him. And turn the devil loose on this fellow and just see how much he can take. How much he can stand. Uh, sometimes it seems like uh, maybe you doesn't seem that way to you. Sometimes it seems that way to me. Uh, like the devil's going to pull every uh, trick in the book to try to get me to quit God and quit the Bible and everything else. And I'm going to turn some devil loose on this fellow and see how he makes out. Now the name of this first devil over here is going to be disability. This is all. Most of you folks know nothing about it. I know nothing about it. I've always had disgust, disgustingly good health. Uh, I'm 74 this year, and I've been in the hospital six weeks since I was born. Six weeks. And I thought I could still jog three miles, do two thousand of jump rope without stopping. Doesn't know anything about this ago. I'm going to go spoil kid, you know. But you ever stop thinking how nice it is to have two legs and two arms? Amen. You ever thank God you can walk? Amen. You're not going to make a dime tonight, folks. It's going to get rough. This is just the introduction. Come on, preacher. Yeah. A lot of my friends don't have any legs. Yeah. I've got some new Christian friends on crutches, and I've got some new Christian friends on wheelchairs. But I go out and jog at the night out there in the black top at night, 11, 12 o'clock at night. Every time I take a step, I just thank God I can even walk. Amen. I think about John Hall, wheelchair, Carl Baker, wheelchair, Tim Lee, wheelchair, Rex Harrison, on crutches. You ever thank God for your breath? Oh, everybody breathes well. No, they don't. You ever go to the, the war hospital war and see when the oxygen tests? You know what told me one time? She said, Brother Ruffman, she said, I, I haven't breathed a breath of air in the last five years without pain in my body. You know, I woke up and down this country and travel, and, and I travel. I'm a little gold medallion, super medallion, jet set, whatever you call them. And I'm going through Atlanta airports, and going through Nuremberg airports, and Moscow airports, and CO airports, and Manila airports, and Honolulu airports, and Las Vegas. I don't even know. I've been to so many places, I don't even where I've been, man. I, I get in the morning in the hotel and phone my wife and say, having a good time, where am I? <laughs> well, I've been up in the air long and the seagull was sore feet. <laughs> and I get to those places, you know what I see? I see hordes of people, millions of people, millions, millions. Most of them have two arms and two legs and two eyes and two eyes. They can speak, they can walk, they can run, they can eat, they can talk. It's amazing how God is how good God has been to a mess of sinners. Yes, yes, yes. But occasionally you see them, double cliff pallet, hunchback, club foot, water brain babies, mongoloid, that kind of thing. How could that work for good? I ask. 
How could we? I, I know a fellow up there in Baltimore, Maryland, honest as that fellow's so ugly. He'll never have any wife, really have any friends, and he lost his family and raised him a long time ago. I'm the so ugliest man I've ever seen in my life. I mean, really, he had a hunchback and a club foot and a double cleft mouth of wolves all over his face. Come monster. Save him. Love the Lord. I got him preaching the street there at Peter and John this uh, place up there in Arlington, outside of Baltimore. We get preaching up there, and I've been up there on the platform in the back of that truck preaching. And I watched him while I was preaching, passing out tracks on the sidewalk. He go out and pass out a bunch of tracks on that sidewalk there, and I see people go by and on cussing and throw the tracks down. And every now and then somebody take one. And he'd say, the hell out of the truck, you know. And I'm one of God's tapes. While I was preaching there one night, I saw him in about an hour and a half take three people over under the arcade of the store front so they needed to be destroyed. I thought, you know what he is? That fellow so disabled, he'll never have any friends. You know what that fellow has to do all his life? He'll have to trust in God. You know what kind of company he'll have to have? He'll just have to keep company with one. You know what will happen? He'll be a spiritual powerhouse and give reward to the judgment seat of Christ so you folks will never get in the meeting. Yeah. You say, why? Because all things work together for good. Some of you folks, you can talk well. You can meet people well. You're not disabled. You can shoot the ball. You make a good impression. But you're not doing anything for God. Sometimes those handicaps get a fellow where God can use him and God do something with him that he ain't going to do with you. Discipline. <coughs> I've got a friend named Bill Mayer. I don't know if he's still alive or not, but that fellow, honestly, God, that fellow preached for something like, well, I know he'd already been preached 20 years. He'd be in the ministry now about 50 years now. And Bill Mayer had several poems when he was a boy, and he was eight years old. He couldn't speak coherently and couldn't walk. He learned how to stand walk when he got to be about 10. Probably could walk when he was about 12. He got coherent when he was about 13 or 14. You know what Bill Mayer told me? He said, you know what I want to be when I grew up when I was a little boy? I said, what? He said, I want to be a murderer. I want to kill people. I said, why? He said, well, he said, every Sunday people bring their children to the, the cerebral palsy war for all us cerebral palsy boys and girls were. We couldn't stand it. We'd flop around and fall around and chew our tongue and rise, go back in our head. And little boys and girls sit there at the glass and laugh at us and make fun of us through the glass. And he said, I made up my mind when I grew up I was going to be a murderer. Well, he grew up and got saved. Amen. Lord <laughs> fixed that. Brother grew up and got saved, and he preached. You wouldn't think God called up on a preacher who couldn't talk, would you? Well, he would. We had a guy come to our church one time from up in Germantown, Ohio, named Weldon Jones. I'm going down to meet for him in Mexico in about two weeks. He put three indigenous churches down there. Amen. He couldn't Amen. pronounce all on the end of the word. He'd say, uh, you know, roller coaster, uh, roller, roller. Roar, roar, roar. He couldn't get it on, man, of the word. The king, the, you know, uh, 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 word man and the, and the R and the thing, he couldn't get the thing. Oh, uh, give me a word man and R. Uh, what? Peter. I got two in one time. Toaster. Kosher? Toaster. Eater. Toaster. 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 He couldn't say toaster. 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 He got down in Spain and the word don't end an R down there in Mexico. <laughs> and the guy speaking in Mexican, he's one hundred of people in Christ. <laughs> Amen. I'm the Lord knows what he's doing, if you don't. <laughs> and Bill Mayer, I have in my church of preaching up in the pulpit and say, All out of us had a Bible bound from the Roman chapter nine. Right, he's not up in his sporting, you know, start with Paul. You can still tell he had it. Oh, <laughs> And he'd get up there and start out like that. I remember one time I had a bunch of cripples come to my church. We had a regular old Robert service there, you know. At least it looked like it, you know. They weren't getting people. But we had them in there. Well, we wanted to have them here. We had all the disabled people come in. We had them on crutches and lying on beds and stuff around them. They got up to preach. I'll never forget about it. There'd be a thousand. But I got up there and opened the Romans and he said, um, The Bible says there, uh, Who of you to say to the uh, uh, potter, Why hast thou made me what? They said, God made the way one made it. Who do you complain and say, why did God make me like this? Who do you think you are? Amen. Whew, man. No, I couldn't say that to a bunch of crippled people, but boy, he could. And he did. Amen. And they could say it. I mean, I went to home one time, my father got, uh, he was 
one of these fat boys that had the grand trouble. He was about 15 years old, got about 370. He wouldn't go to church anywhere. So he embarrassed him to go to church, you know, because he was you know, too fat. And he, I, I dealt with that kid about five or six minutes sitting next to him and got nowhere trying to win him to Christ. He had all this alibi, and he was fat with alibi, and you know, you're not even getting saved. Well, you see my condition, you see my condition. And all the time I was talking to that fellow, Bill was sitting right next to me, just kind of, I could hear just kind of <laughs> breathing like this. So I finally stepped aside and let Bill hand me. And Bill moved right next to him, put his finger around his chest, and said, Well, this is fat boy. <laughs> <laughs> he said, if you don't get saved, you're going to hell and fly like a goose ball. <laughs> We're going down the street in the car, you know, and Bill was driving. Bill was driving, and then I was, at that time, I was going through a trial, at least I thought it was. Of course, you know, hindsight's better than, than foresight. And it wasn't trying to be much of anything, but I was really, you know, a big catastrophe in my life at the time. And I was going out there and kind of sorry for myself, licking my wounds. I didn't know what he was thinking. He was just driving. I was looking out for him, and he said, all of a sudden, he said, Boy, I sure am glad God didn't heal me. <laughs> I turned and said, what's that for? <laughs> well, I said, bless God, you know, if I didn't have this affliction, I wouldn't have had a deal with these folks, but boy, I can reach them. <laughs> Amen. I said, okay, God, I'll shut up. I'll shut up. <laughs> we, we dealt with those people. You know what Bill told me one time? Bill Mayer said he had a friend who was born blind. And one day his friend who was born blind said to him, he said, I sure am glad God, I sure am glad God didn't give him any eyes. And Bill said, well, you said that for the guy. So just think, I've never seen this stuff. He said, I've heard this horrible stuff people talk about and stuff, but I got no idea what it looks like. I've never seen it. And he said, just think, the first thing I'm going to see is somebody who loved me enough to die for. Amen. Amen. Now, think about that. Amen. And he says, all things work together for good for them and love God for them who are called according to his purpose. Oh, and that is all. we got another demon over here. The name of this demon here is Death. I guess the most disobeyed command in the Bible by Americans is that one. You know what that commandment says? It says, oh, no man, anything. <laughs> That's in Romans chapter 13. Boy, you talk about a disobeyed commandment. Oh, no man, anything. Well, this country is three trillion dollars in debt. No bunch of people who print counterfeit money. I mean, like, really, man. You want to get rid of the national debt? debt? Put a rope in it. I'll get rid of it I get rid of it for you. You know what I do? I just print three trillion dollars in thousand dollar bills and give them the Federal Reserve and tell them to get out of the country. <laughs> amen. Amen. Come on, amen. amen. It wouldn't take the money. Why wouldn't they take it? You gotta take it. That's right. That's right. You mean it ain't no good? <laughs> counterfeit. Yeah. <laughs> well, if it ain't no good, it's counterfeit money. But you in this country, up to debt up there is three trillion dollars. Every person born in this country today, every little baby comes in, owes oh, something like seventy thousand dollars in federal government. Now, can't that be a, a hindrance to you? You want to serve God. You always have been debt, debt up your neck. Young guys come down to school, I gotta get these bills paid off first. Some of them never did come down. I spent the rest of the life trying to pay off bills. You your generation was raised to believe that you borrow to pay off a loan. I don't know where you got that from. I don't know. That's what they do. They get and then they borrow, and then they borrow, they borrow, they borrow, they borrow. But the interest just kill you, man. And you take when I came up, I came up in the depression. I was always scared to death of getting debt. I still am. I got I, I was there when it happened, boy. Folks talk about a depression this country. You never seen no depression in this country. I think it hit from twenty nine to thirty three, boy. I mean, boy, I mean there was no money there. It was gone, man. And I've always worried about it. That's why I probably never had very much. And uh, my school will never be a very big school. And my church will never be a very big church. I'll never have a lot of property and this and that. I know what you can get. Borrowed. But I'm weary on borrowed. It's always been there and borrowed. Right now, my house is paid for. My school is paid for. My church is paid for. My furniture is paid for. All my cars are paid for. All my hospitals are paid for. Nothing. 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 I'm not ready. I'm not ready. 15 cents. Which means I don't have very much. <laughs> if you want to get a lot, you're going home. Now you take that thing right there. Some of you Christians. Don't think just because you're saying you can't go bankrupt. 
Um, you know what some people think? They think when they get saved, that solves all the problems. Well, it may solve all your problems in eternity, but it doesn't solve all your problems here. That's right. That's the catch on that thing. I mean, uh, you take uh, the same thing that happened to saved people, happen to unsaved people. Do you know that? Some holy, sanctified Christians, they think that the same the thing that happened to unsaved people can't happen to saved people. Yes, they can. Your baby can fall in the car and get killed. Your wife can die in childbirth. You get leukemia. You can wind up a basket case. Apparently, don't think just because you're saved, that's going to solve all that problems. So maybe some of you will declare bankruptcy someday. I don't know. Have you know that all things work together for good to them and love God? One time when a dentist said to a preacher, I've been coming to your church in Jordan, but I'm going to have to quit coming. He said, what's the trouble? And the dentist said, well, I'd rather not talk about it. I just don't feel like coming anymore. And the preacher said, well, my goodness, give us a chance. Tell me what's on your mind. He said, well, it's, I know it's kind of hard to explain. And the preacher said, well, tell me what it is. We do anything about it. But we will. He said, well, preacher. He said, I just can't, I can't enjoy coming to church and sitting there and hearing him use some through teeth that hadn't been paid for. <laughs> And I'm going to say to people out in the world, you know what they'll forgive, you forgive you for almost anything except not paying the bills. That's right. That's right. Debt. How can debt work together for good for a child of God? I got a fellow out of my church named Bill Kreiser, let a young man of the Lord one time. He got saved. He was about 17. And after he got saved, his daddy heard about him. His daddy was a, had a big business, industrial magnet down there. And he called Bill, Bill Christ in and said, what's the big idea of messing with my boy? And he said, well, I wasn't messing with my to Christ. And so my boy's talking a bunch of nonsense now about being called to preach. And Bill said, well, praise the Lord, aren't you glad your boy's called to preach? My fellow said, my son's not going to preach. My son's going to inherit my business. And two months later, he went bankrupt. Lost the whole cock big and flying man. And that kid never got a die. Not a die. So he said, what a terrible thing. No, he's in the ministry. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> we know all things work together for good to them who love God with the call to court and his purpose. Well, let's try this one up here. Divorce. Uh, I mean, let's get them all while we're at it. <laughs> I mean, doesn't the text say we know that all things <coughs> work together for good? You thought there were some exceptions, didn't you? <laughs> some of the brethren are so holy, you know what they think? They think the blood of Jesus Christ, God, and Son, cleanses us from all sin except the one they don't commit. Right. That's right. Yep. Come on. Now, you take that thing right there. I hope you never have to go through that. That's a bad thing. The only person that profits from that are lawyers. Yeah. That's, That's right. Bad. The kids don't, you don't, your wife don't, and anybody else. Maybe you'll go through it. I don't know. You think, well, I just don't think it's Christian. Well, that make a difference. You're not living in a Christian society, man. Well, I'm going up there and said, the judge, I'm, 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 I don't believe in divorce. I don't. You say, Ruffin doesn't believe in divorce? No, sir, I don't believe it. Amen. I wouldn't put away a woman if I had scriptural grounds. And one time I had scriptural grounds. I didn't put her away. I think when you stand there and say, for better or for worse, till death goes part, you mean for better or for worse. That's right. And if it gets worse, you stick it out. Amen. That's what I believe. But what's she going to do if you marry somebody who don't believe that? Now, back in the old days, they had to go down to get a judge and a lawyer to get a trial, not anymore, man. Yeah, that's right. They go down there and fill out the papers, 250 yeah, bucks, yeah. bam, 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 you're gone. Yeah. Well, in Las Vegas, they got divorce machines out there. <laughs> <laughs> they do. You put the money in, a two thing come out, and you fill out the form, mail it in, you know the one come back, stand back, back like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know why. <laughs> Take up one out of two in a divorce today. I preached up there in those big youth camps up in Ohio, and I used to preach to all the fellowship churches in Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan. Back when I was in favor of the PDF, you know. Yeah. I don't know why people can't stand me after a while. <laughs> <laughs> I don't change any. I'm the same character I've always been. Amen. Amen. Anyway, I've got a thing on. I've done. I've gotten up there, and I've said uh, with a uh, with 1,200 young people there. How many of you young people have come to a home where one or both parents have been divorced and a third of the congregation is family? That was in 1969. And those are the best Bible-believing churches in the country. You may go that route. I hope you don't. But if you do, you better remember something. All things work together for good of them and love God or the calling according to His purpose. That's what it says. 
I bet I get some of you folks on believe the text for this night. <laughs> You take that thing and you say, well, they'll never forgive me. No, they won't. And Christians will talk about me. Yes, they will. And I'll be a second-class Christian the rest of my life. Yes, you certainly will. But if God forgives you, who cares? Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. What's wrong with some of you folks in here tonight? You're licking your wounds, looking behind you. That Bible says you press forward. And yeah. Paul yeah. says, forgetting those things. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 I just yeah. can't forget. You've got to forget. You say, people don't forget. All oh, right, they won't forget, but you you better forget. Yeah. Don't you worry about them. Don't take care of that. Right? Amen. I was out one time out there, Sequoia National Forest, south of here, that place I keep trying to think of down there. <laughs> Redwood, Redwood Mountain down there. Redwood Forest down there. And uh, I was sitting at the table with a bunch of preachers, the BBF, and about uh, 20 pastors in the wire sitting around this table, the youth camp, talking about this now and then. All of a sudden, it got quiet. Just as quiet as Turkey Farm and Banks in the afternoon. Boy. And I knew the storm was coming. Yeah. And some preacher across me says, uh, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Ruckman, do you think a divorced man should preach? <laughs> and I said, uh, I'm talking to some real preacher. What'd you say? <laughs> and he said, Do uh, you think a divorced man should preach? And I said, Well, look at it this way. I mean, you never know what you're stepping into one of these things. Yeah. I Sorry. said, Suppose you and your wife ain't getting along too well. As she was sitting next to him, she turned to be red. <laughs> and yeah. dropped her head. <laughs> I said, uh, I said, suppose uh, one day she just gets up and leaves you. You're going to quit preaching. He said, well, I don't know. I said, did God call you to preach? He said, yes. I said, he called your wife to preach? He said, no. I said, could you go to quit because she quits? He said, well, I never thought about that. I said, well, think about it. Couldn't pass the soul. <laughs> you know, one time I met a brother of mine down. He was a nice fellow. I forget his name offhand. But he went up to the BBC at Bible Baptist College in Springfield. And his wife got messing around with some deacon in the church there. And they went off and got married. And they got his kids and told his parents that he lost his mind. He even shot treatments, just custody of the kids. It's like a fine bunch of Christians do at times, you know. I mean, BBF, they don't a thousand years, brother. They got some wimps and dinglings to it. Like yeah, anyway, they got his, got his wife and kids, you know, and all that stuff. And they showed off married somebody else. He came back to Pensacola, and boy, he dragged at the bottom of the barrel. I got a hold of him and tried to cheer him up, you know, give him a few little stories, you know, get him laughing and stuff, but I didn't get much for it with him. <coughs> and things went on there for about four or five weeks. One day I saw a fellow going down the street, across from the street from me, and he was whistling and kind of springing along, had kind of springing his step like he walked in the cloud nine. I went over there and said, uh, what's that talking about? He said, oh, brother, Ruckman, he said, I'm the Lord of God, now things fine, everything's fixed up, it's going to work out great. I said, what happened? Your wife come back? No, no, she married this other guy who lived in this part of the country. I said, well, what's, what's the deal? And he said, well, Ruckman, he said, there's something I forgot to tell you. I said, what's that? He said, well, he said, uh, when I was about 10 years old, I got saved. When I was 15, the Lord called me to preach and called me to join the United States Navy and be a missionary in the United States Navy. He said, I made it in my mind I wasn't about to do that. I was going to come out high and dry on land, get a good church for about $300 a week, and live like the rest of them live, so live, live. And he said, I made it in my mind I was not going to do that. And he said, you know something? I got thinking the other day, my wife's gone, my kids are gone, but nothing now can stop me from joining the Navy. And I went down there and joined the Navy, and he said, ever since then, I've been just happy to be the <laughs> Well, that's a rough way to get in the will of God, I guess. <laughs> but it's better than staying out of the will of God. Yeah. Now listen, some of you first class citizens, you better watch your step. Um, you may be worried so worried about a second class citizens, you make a mess of it yourself. Yeah. Paul one time said, I'm going to Rome. The Lord said, No, you don't. The Lord said, Yes, I and Paul said, Yes, I do. The Lord said, I'm going to warn him five times not to go. He warned him five times, and he went anyway. You know what happened? He lost two years of his ministry in jail. And he wound up you know, on the breakers, taking a board and trying to get on shore. A second class carriage class, brother, that was going to the bottom of the hole <laughs> with a rash in the building water. He could have gone on a DC 10. Yeah. But he got there. But he got there. Amen. And some of you first class Christians, you ain't going to get there if you ain't careful. Better watch it. Better watch it. All right, all things work together for good, but then we love God to call according to his purpose. I've got a brother law named Bubba May up in central Alabama up in the Black Belt, and he married a terror boy. She was a terror boy. I mean, she was something else. 
And I mean, after about four or five years, that thing all came apart. She just got fine, and then the thing blew up. He married a fine Christian girl. They've been married now for something like 45 years and worked out just fine, just fine. I don't recommend divorce to anybody. I bow to the wife, sheep not to be loose. You got your instructions. You got your instructions. But if it happens, don't throw in the towel and quit. I was preaching one time down in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, and a, uh, a, a professor from South, uh, South, Mid South, phoned up the preacher where I was preaching. Uh, I don't know why this, but college professors have a complex about me for some reason. <laughs> and, right. and he phoned up this pastor at this church, and he phoned him up, and he said, uh, Are you having Ruckman in for a meeting? He said, Yes, I am. He said, That's going to hurt your work to do that. He said, We're having me, and we want to have a good meeting, and people are blessed. And he said, Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't know you had a daughter in your poet. And he said, oh, yeah, we have them all the time. <laughs> and that professor said, you do? And he said, yes. He said, matter of fact, I'm an adulterer myself. <laughs> and that professor said, you are? He said, I thought you only been married once. He said, that's right. But he's thinking on the Bible, says, yeah. whoever looks upon a woman to lust after the heart, that's where they come in the daughter. <laughs> then Pharisees had a time of it. Yep. That's right. <laughs> All things work together for good of them and love God with the call according to his purpose. Now, you see what I'm doing here. I'm turning loose off. Turn loose off. I'm going to get these seven of the worst devils I can drum up and just see what they can do to hurt this Christian. And my pastor says, we know that all things work together for good of them and God, love God, so that we the call according to his purpose. Now, maybe this next one up here is disease. It must be rough to be sick all the time. It must be rough not being able to get more than two or three hours of sleep at night. I got a lot of Christian friends like that. I got, I got a Christian friends who sleep about two hours at night. They got their choice. They get the nerve centered and spend seven and spend the rest of the life in a wheelchair. Or else they can leave the thing where it is and try to survive on drugs and get some rest and that kind of thing. That must be a terrible thing. How in the world could that work for anybody to do it man? How could that be? I got a friend down there in, uh, in uh, near Pensacola, he was over at a place called uh, Foley, Alabama. And he was from, uh, let's see, you know, Mississippi, up in the Meridian, up there. Well, uh, too late, I think, it's not a fish very fine. You know, the North Mississippi, some place. Too boy. Just too boy, North Mississippi. Got through. Too boy. And, and, and he, when, he, when he joined the Army, he was a saved man, saved man. But he liked to gamble. And he got gambling. And the army, you ruined his gut, get it. Now, now this fellow David Bill Sharp is a PhD in mathematics. And he could figure the army <coughs> crack it in. I mean, so I bet he had wins more. Uh, he, he figure out the physical probability he could do it. And he made him a mint. He'd make sometimes a thousand dollars a night shooting traps. And after the war was over, he came back to the States. He came back to the States. When he got back to the States, uh, the uh, stomach began to act up on him. And he got like a god and got him a job as a paint contractor and he made a pretty good business, pretty good living at it, but not too good. And that old, he had an ulcer thing. That old thing would twitch at night, get him at night, he'd wake up at night and drink this fat night, you know, and, and bleed an ulcer. And that went on for a couple of years. One day I was talking to Bill Sharp about this and that little thing. You know what he said? He said, I sure am glad God didn't heal me. I sure am glad God didn't heal me. And I said, why? He said, well, he said, you know, I'm making about, uh, about $400 a week as a paint contractor, which is pretty good back in the 1960s, you know. Yeah. But he said, uh, if I get me a little crap game, a little five-card draw, seven-card stuff, I could get $2,000 one night. But he said, every time I start to think about it, that also goes, er. <laughs> that also goes, er. I decided not to do it. <laughs> you don't keep Bill Sharp in fellowship with the Lord? A hurting pain. And we know all things work together for good. You say, oh God, if you just take it away, I'd be good. I know I'd be good without it. Maybe. Maybe. But the Lord probably knows you better than you know you. Yeah. We got a church called Ida Bell Sauter. Ida Bell Sauter was a chronic invalid for 32 years. 32 years she lay on her back. And every year we prayed God to take her home. And he never did. It went on and on for 32 years. Some of you folks aren't 32 years old yet. She'd lie there, rheumatoid arthritis, all double up like this, pick her out of the bedroom of the bathroom, take her back in. She couldn't walk, she couldn't stand up. All cut up, save one. 
Say, woman, love the Lord. I had a bell saw her. All the time you've been out dating, messing around, fishing, hunting, fooling around, and football and basketball, baseball and soccer, and walking around, that woman just been lying there 32 years. Hmm. I'd come in there and say, morning, Miss Sawyer. I'm Brother Upton. I said, let me hear you say, praise the Lord, Mrs. Sawyer. Praise the Lord. She said, better some of you say it. You got nothing wrong with you at all. I won't get a blessing. I ain't gonna see that lady. I often got thinking about that thing. I thought to myself, uh, that woman really knows more about God than I ever know about. I won't say I'm gonna lie that flat in the back there three years. Don't you know God had to get real with her for her to go through that thing? And that, that my flesh cleansed at that fall. I read in my Bible, he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I said to myself, roughly, if you're going to get rid of no God, really know Him, you're going to have to go through something like that. I don't like that. My flesh just put draw on that. But I know it's so. I know it's so. I bet that woman had a power and prayer I'll never have in my life. And I want that. I want that presence. I want that knowledge of the presence of God, that, that realness of Christ near me and in me. He's in me. He's just near me. I'm part of Him. He's part of me. But it gets in the real time, don't it? I guess it's hard of things I can see. I'll be frank with you, folks. I've been wanting to see Jesus Christ for a long time. Because I've been bragging about him. I've been shooting off my mouth about Christ for nearly a half a century. In 46 years this year, I've never even seen him. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Some of us talking, 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 I never seen him. I want to see him. I want to see him. I get tired of looking at you. <laughs> I just try to look at myself. I get try to look at my family. I just, I love them. I appreciate them. I just, just, you know, truck on the pants and the board up here and you down there, the street out there, the gasoline station, Taco Bell, McDonald's, you know, and uh, pink toy pizza and all that kind of stuff. It's, a, it's the same almost. Anyway. I get tired of it. I get tired of planes. I get tired of airports. I just get tired of everything. I just say, I would like to see this one that I've been talking about all this time. Yeah. And sometimes I want to see it. I want to see it. But in the meantime, it isn't, it isn't real enough to me. It's real to some people. That's one or two more here. Take this from here. Desertion. Nobody likes to be a wallflower. Nobody likes to be deserted. Run off. Left with something. I got to have a student come to my uh, school one time. Tall, skinny fellow, love the Lord, in North Carolina. His uh, mother had something like five children. My daddy was took him through uh, Phoenix City down there, Columbus, Georgia, down the book down there, Fort Benning, and he stopped at a drugstore there. And this boy here was about five years old, and he got out of the car and went to the drugstore, went to the front end, went out the back end, and never saw him again. He stood with that woman out there, all the kids in the car, and never saw him again. But everybody deserted. Up there at Tennessee Temple, ago, they had a temple years ago, they had a great saint up there named Charlie Weigel. And Charlie Weigel lived up past 90 someplace. And he wrote a song called, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus, which you probably heard. Millions have been blessed with that song, but you know the background of that song? Wife deserted him. He's going to walk out and let him slap. Folks don't like that. Nobody likes that. Kids, hey. oh, yeah. oh, let's get down another the end here. What about this one? How come a little white cash to help a fellow out for a family? Can you tell me that? How can that be? How can the death of a loved one, a partner you live with for 50 years, how can that be a benefit to you? You ever think about that? The text says all things work together for good. If it said all things, it must mean all things. I don't like funerals. I've never liked funerals. I hate it. But you have to have to have them. You ever think about what death does? You ever stop thinking, you probably didn't, but you ever stop thinking about how Theodore F. and, and Dr. DeHaan were able to stay on the radio year after year after year without ever asking for funds? I know how they did. Christians died and left them in the wills. That's how they stay on there. Well, you know what Bob Jones here told me one time? He said, well, old man McKenzie died. Praise God. McKenzie was a millionaire, a, a lumber, lumber millionaire in Panama City. All these guys that build these big works have a millionaire behind them. You get a millionaire behind you, of course, you can't get a millionaire these days. You're not going to live in very big. But Anderson behind I, you know, and Corley behind Beck and I, Morton. And, uh, and McKinney behind Bob Jones here. 
And I said, well, well, he died. He said, yeah. I said, didn't he give you about $50,000 a year? He said, yeah. So what do you pray to God for that for? He said, well, I guess we'll have to get back to trusting God. Yeah. See? All things work together for good of them that love God because of God's his purpose. You ever seen that thing work? Death. Work for good. I'll tell you something death does. It stops, uh, stops a life of sin short. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. John let him get the bullets. Well, thank God for that finally. Hey. <laughs> I'm yeah. impressed he might have dosed himself to death. Too bad he lived long as he did. He wouldn't damn for of money. Hey, yeah. Folks don't like that. It's the bad company you keep. Yeah. You worry about my book, Harry Devon Kufis, you just some Kufis of the devil from you folks. Yeah. Right. right. And the company you have in your living room, I would invite him to rake up my foot yard. Amen. 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 But you take that business right there, that death, death will stop from sinning. Death will stop suffering. I right. got a my church I saw dying for 70 years. His name was Barrel Hunt. Now, oh boy, I prayed for him and prayed for him and asked God to save me, to take him home. He'd cry. I said, what are you crying about? He said, why doesn't God take me? Why doesn't God take me? I got over my church right now, and the old folks home been on there for two years, and built a thousand dollars a month, and she's been ready to go home for five years, and lonely, and a mind leaving her, and why God doesn't take her home, I don't know. I don't know. I know death can work together for good. I know that. I got it in my will. I got it in my will, and my wife, that if I get in the hospital like a vegetable, and they got me hooked up and all that stuff, my wife has the right to come up there and take me off that thing and take me home and let me die. And I will said, if any doctor or lawyer or policeman tried to stop her, she'd shoot the prison boss. Amen, brother. I don't want to hang around that brother. Yeah. No more. Get on home. Yeah. There's some good things about death. Death can work together for good of them and love God with the call according to this purpose. Now, you take uh, this last thing I'm going to talk about. You wouldn't see possibly how it could work together if anybody's good. But I'm going to illustrate the best way I know how. How can a soul going to hell be a blessing to you? Your mother dies and goes to hell. How could that be a blessing? He said all things. If he said all things, I guess he meant what he said. But how in the world does that work? You ever think about that? You know, my mother and daddy died in the city, as far as I know. Of course, in the last minute, may, something may have happened, you know, under the anesthesia, you know. You know how it is, under the case after case, for this assault, this fellow Tom Williams and Pam Williams, you got to hear his testimony. She was a vegetable, I mean, two million units of penicillin. And he had, when he got her back to life again and made her work her bones and stuff, and she was screaming with pain to get her back on her feet again. That's a remarkable thing. And while she was unconscious for three weeks, they're playing scripture in her head, who hear And the Jewish doctor had his prescription written. This woman is to be exposed to the Word of God 24 hours a day. Amen. Up there in the intensive care. Amen. And when that woman came out of that thing, she was telling them things that happened while she went on. So you always hope for the best, see, but it's scant consolation. I always hope that somewhere, maybe after witness that did my mom and daddy, that when they were unconscious or when they thought they were unconscious, that the Holy Spirit dealt with it. I always think maybe after I did pray and for them for eight years and witness the two of them send them tracks and trying to live a life before them and have some effect, maybe in the last hours, the Holy Spirit called to their attention, but there wasn't any testimony. He couldn't, but you couldn't hang your hat in anything. And then when they went ahead and died, I don't get any blessing out of it, nor my mother's in hell. That's no blessing me at all. You know what we do? In modern fundamental media, kind of a, an assembly line way of winning the souls, you know, Roman Road. At least that was the style a couple of years back. You got to turn around like bony sausages in a string and out of a factory. You know what we forget? We forget that if it's a really new birth, it's a genuine miracle. Now, if you've really been born again and you're a new creation, that's a miracle of God. That is something you turn out like a factory. That's a miracle. And sometimes we forget that. But you know what God does to us? He'll take someone love when we love, so they close to our heart and get us praying for them and praying for them and praying for them and witnessing over them and bawling over them and crying for them. No matter what we do, we can't do nothing with it. You know why he does that? He does that to show you that that thing is a miraculous work and he has to do it. And you'll get, you'll, you'll learn it after a while. I'm not talking about being a Calvinist, I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying God will put a block across your way the way you'll get the message that if it's done, he's going to do it. That's what he did with me. 
I was out way in this church in California years ago out there near Havona. I forget the name of it, but it was a beautiful place. He was running about found in Sunday school, and I was preaching for him. And one night, during the invitation, I heard a whoop like a Comanche Indian. And I looked down there, and here was a, here was a woman running down the aisle. I said, oh, you a girl about 17. Boy, we even had a kid just screamed the top of her head, head, lungs. And I said, wait a minute, I said, what's that? He said, look down over there, look down on the right-hand corner. A bunch of personal over there, he was a woman about 45 years old. She gets saved. And I said, what about it? He said, that's that girl's mother. Yeah. And I said, that girl got saved. She's 10 years old. She's been praying seven years for her mama. And her mama didn't save her. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. And I remember sitting up there in my bench, looking down there and saying to myself, well, my mother was raised in Pasadena. That's just a few miles from that. She had a Chinese cook and a Japanese gardener and to work any crossword club in this country in 15 minutes. Her last name was Armstrong from Pasadena. Yes. <laughs> I don't know about that connection. <laughs> anyway, I'm sitting here like this. I looked down and said, woman down there, I said to myself, well, if you can't win your own mama, maybe you can win somebody else's mama. Amen. You know something you ought to take that attitude? Your mother and daddy are going to hell, your sister, wife, or brother, and mother are going to hell, nothing you can do about it, you know you can. You know what you ought to do? You ought to start working with somebody else. Yeah. What you ought to do? Yeah. Years ago in Pensacola, Florida, I had a call one night, about Saturday night it was, at about, uh, almost been about 1 o'clock in the morning. And nothing a pastor likes any better than a call at about 1 o'clock in the morning, Saturday <laughs> night. And lady said, Brother Ruffin, my... My brother's down here, Alton Nelson, he's dying. He's come down and talk to him in the hospital. He's dying right now. And I said, well, I said, is the church Christ preacher down there? Get the candlelight. I said, uh, she said, yes. I said, I don't want to come down there and get an argument with the candlelight. In the middle of the dive, deathbed scene. I said, if this church is down there, we've been going to church, this pastor down there, I better just stay out of it. And she said, brother, look, you've got to come. You don't know a few years back. You remember, don't you? And I said, yeah, I remember. This fellow had, the, he had what they call a bright disease. And the calcium in your bones doesn't get to it when you get a shot. You get a shot about once every year, then you get a shot every transfusion, transfusion. About every six months, and a transfusion about every month, and a transfusion about every week, and a transfusion every day, and it's gone. And when I saw him, he was just the early part of the state, and I went up to the hospital room one day and got up there. His sister was up there. This was about three years before this. I got up there and his sister was up there and she said, I'll go down to the coffee shop and let you talk. And she went down to the coffee shop and left me in the room there with Alton. And I dealt with him. He's a candlelight. That's church Christ. They believe in baptism and regeneration. And, but he wasn't argumentative. He was open. And I dealt with him. He seemed to get somewhere. And I didn't get a decision out of him. But I said, if I leave you a track when you read it, he said he would. So I gave him a track and left the there in the bed and went on about my way. Well, I thought about it. For a year it went by. Now I get this call. So I said, okay, I'll come down. So I come down, I come down in the middle of the night, I get dressed about 2 o'clock in the morning, get out of the hospital about 2.30 or quarter or three, get in the hallway on the death floor, you know, and I'm up really good against the thing like this. And I hear this candlelight preacher in the room talking to the dying man. I heard him say, oh Lord, bless us, and may we so live that you can reward us with eternal life. Yeah. And I lean up against that thing, and you, I was thinking, I was a man, boy. You dirty dog, you dirty dog, why don't you tell that poor devil how to get saved? You dirty soul, so man, I mean, the words were coming to my mind, boy. And after a while, it came up, I mean, the very idea. Help us so live that you may reward us for the eternal life. Amen. Nuts, boy, no. Amen. Capital N, nuts. Amen. You're going to get the reward for eternal life. Eternal life is a gift. Yeah. Amen. You understand yeah. that? Amen. And I'm out there. And Pretty soon they come out the door, and his sister comes over and says, come here, come here. I come over there and come in, and we start the bed. He's all jacked up like a wreck on the He's got two in his nose. He's trying to pull the tubes out of the nurses, keep them in. He's stinging his own blood, bad scene, man. And his, and his sister says to me, brother up, and she said, there's something I'm going to tell you. I said, what's that? She said, well, you on that day that you talked to him when I went down to the coffee shop? I said, I remember that day. She said, uh, you know what, what he was doing when I came back up? I said, what? And she said, well, the doctor told him not to get out of his bed. And she said, when I came back up, he was out in the middle of the floor on his hands and knees over that crack that you gave him. Yeah. And she said, since then, he's acted so differently. 
<laughs> so I went around there and got a lot of by the fellow's place was. He couldn't move nothing hardly. So I got my mouth right on the neck of the air, and I said, uh, Alton, I said, I'm the guy who gave that crack a couple years back in the hospital. Do you remember me? He goes, I could. I said, that day that I left that track, did you accept Jesus Christ your personal Savior? He says, I said, Amen. I said, I ask you one more question. I said, are you trusting right now nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ to take away your sins? And a guy went away. And I said, bless God, glory to God, man. Had to pray with him and got up to leave, went out the door. His sister grabbed him with her arm and she said, oh, do you think that's enough? <laughs> Is it enough? Amen. If God coming down here as a man and shedding his blood, God's blood can't take him your sins, what in heaven earth could? That's right. Is that enough? Well, bless my soul, if I had enough, you folks all just good dead in hell with a key shut. Amen. Door shut and key for it. I went home that night, went to bed. I got about seven o'clock the next morning, felt like I had all night hang on the man. Came and got shaved in the mirror, and all of a sudden the joy of the air, bell was getting kind of ringing my heart, and it kind of, kind of got kind of hopping around, but I was near to go and have a good time. You know what I thought? You know what I was thinking? I was thinking, isn't life strange? That preacher's damnation is my salvation. I'm getting the blessing out of him being lost. You say, why? Because in that hospital room, I saw what I had to do and what he had to do. Yeah. And that was a blessing to me. And we thought all things work together for good. Amen. Amen. We love God, man. We call it God to do I do not know why all around me my hopes all shattered seem to be. God's perfect plan I cannot see. But someday He'll make it plain. Someday He'll make it plain to me someday when I his face shall see. Someday from tears I shall be free. For someday I shall understand. Amen. I cannot tell the depths of love <coughs> that moves the Father's heart above. My faith to test, my love to prove, but someday he'll make it plain. Someday he'll make it plain to me. Someday when I his face shall see. Someday from tears I shall be free. For someday. I shall understand. Amen. Let's go forward in prayer. Father, we thank this blessed promise that many women in this building know nothing about this promise. That poor soul that's sitting there to walk out that door, they couldn't look anybody in the face and say, I know that all things are working together for my good. And you walk it to them free. I have a chance to, uh, to lay claim the greatest promise that God ever gave man or man ever gave man. Well, I pray some of might accept Christ the Savior. Some of might have trust their shed blood for the sin. Some of might will openly confess him and receive him and have the joy of salvation. Knowing that from time to night on, come hell or high water, come alien, mountainous space, UFOs, terrorism, bankruptcy, international war, atom bomb, nuclear bombs, revolution, whatever, whatever. It'll work together for their good. Bless the man for a few minutes. Before we get the invitation tonight, let's pray just a few minutes for the position of the plan. And I want to ask you tonight, are you saved? Are you ready? Can you claim the promise? Or can you look God in the face tonight and say, Lord, I'm yours and you're mine, so I'm claiming that everything that's happened to me is going to work together for my good. Listen, listen. If you're not saved tonight, nothing is working together for your good. What's working on you is God, the goodness of God, trying to bring you to repentance. And the accidents you've been through, the narrow escapes, 
the near calamities, the tragedy, the sickness, the heartaches, the bills, the frustration, the dirty deals, the raw deals, if it's just for one thing, and I said, turn you to Jesus Christ, where you can have eternal life. And if you haven't done that yet, then you've defeated the purpose of your suffering. God sent it to you to be merciful to you. He doesn't want to see you hurt forever. You die without Christ, your suffering's going to start, and it won't even end. God help you. Father, bless your word. Honor your word. May it bring forth some fruit here tonight, like a good tree, bring it forth good fruit. Maybe somebody here tonight understand what I've said tonight and lay hold of this promise. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Let's stand. That's the move you come to conduct in the day of the Somebody take a Bible and show you how to be saved. You need somebody to pray with you.